Okay. So welcome everybody. My name is Corinne Salajano. I'm proud to welcome you to the wonderful Wellness Wednesday through the Wild Rose Wellness Hub. And uh, tonight we are lucky to have as a guest speaker, Dr. Diana Monia, who is in her own right an optician or an optometrist, pardon me, for over 40 years, as well as she's an author of two books. The latest uh, is The Art of the Grift, which we are going to discuss tonight. And we're going to talk about um, the reason behind her writing the book and the purpose that she's hoping to accomplish by um, having people read the book and bring awareness to um, grifters and what they can do to a family and to a person. And um, Dr. Monia, if you're ready, I will turn the floor over to you. So to give an idea of what grifter is, just as an explanation, uh, grifting is really a person uh, who often takes advantage of an older person who perhaps has, has some assets that can be seized or taken. So usually what they do is they befriend some per, uh, a person, and it's usually uh, uh, a senior, uh, often uh, someone who is emotionally vulnerable. Uh, particularly during this COVID time, it's been really tough because people have been isolated. And to, to talk to anybody and to, to whether it's online or even on the phone uh, really means a lot. And of course, for someone to come over and help out a little bit, uh, especially the very trusting seniors uh, get taken advantage of. So my story is simply this. Uh, Uncle George was a... Um, a lovely gentleman, he and his wife uh, had been married for something over 60 or so years. She had um, suddenly died um, in November of 2019 from a heart attack at home uh, in their condo. Uh, George and Elaine, her name was Elaine, Elaine didn't, they didn't have any children, and not for wanting to try, but in those days, and they were both in their uh, 80 and 90, uh, you know, it was difficult and they didn't adopt any children, but they were very good Samaritans to not only the church, but the community and gave lots of things away. So we understand later. So throughout their life, and uh, their idea was that upon passing, they would give this money to the charity of their choice, which apparently we learn later would be the Salvation Army. Well, after Elaine had suddenly died, George uh, became very lonely, even though, and COVID had just broken out. So we, because he had a heart condition, we would contact him and see how he was doing. Everything seemed to be fine. Then about six months after um, we had spoken to George and we'd spoken every second month, about, about six months after uh, Elaine had passed away, he phoned us up saying that he had a new friend. And uh, we were happy about that. Uh, although he lived in this condo complex where there were lots of other people uh, like him. And so we thought, well, maybe it's just a friend from you know, the complex. Uh, we find out later that uh, this lady uh, was something like 30 years younger than him. And uh, uh, became his, uh, how should I say, friend in the sense that uh, she would um, uh, take him out to her acreage uh, for drives. And of course, he really enjoyed this. He would work very hard on this acreage, uh, which we found out was in receivership. And of course, he was spending a lot of money in repairing it and so on. Then we get the most oddest of call from George uh, saying that he was going to buy this lady whose name was Elaine too. So we'll just call her Elaine too, um, a house because he didn't want her living on an acreage, uh, even though the acreage was in receivership. But she had had a very battered and bruised life and he felt very, very sorry for her. And uh, so he was going to help her out. And he wanted to know what we thought about it. Well, we said, George, you know, you can do whatever you want with your money, of course, but, you know, be safe and help him on the title. And, you know, in case something happens, uh, she can either buy it or uh, lease it or whatever she wants to do. So um, 
George went ahead with, uh, how shall I say, uh, without even consulting with us, and we would follow on again, and it seemed to be uh, that, uh, you know, this house deal didn't go through right away, and we weren't sure where it went, where it had gone, and so we assumed that it had failed. Um, and then we got a call from him saying that the uh, uh, bank uh, would not approve them. He was going to give uh, this Elaine, which was something like a half a million dollars to buy this house because they wanted him to prove that he was competent. So we were very upset about that. And uh, we said, that's probably not a bad idea. And this is safe. So again, we didn't hear from him for a couple more months. And I guess the transaction went through and the house was bought and here we, so we would phone George every now and again, seeing that we couldn't get a hold of him. So one day, about a year and a half into the, I said to my husband, you know, I'm very concerned about George. Something is telling me that there's something, there is nothing, there's something wrong. So. I remember get, getting the name of this new Elaine that he had befriended. And I desperately tried to get, and I tried again. And then one moment I actually got a hold of her and I said, listen, uh, where's George? We haven't heard from her or anything. Oh, uh, oh, well, hospital. In the hospital, like, what is he doing? Oh, well, his heart is not well. And, um, I've taken him to the hospital and uh, here we are. I said, well, don't you think that maybe you should let his family know? And she said, well, about that. And I said, well, listen, in the heart of COVID, COVID had been uh, going on for about a year and a half. Well, she said, you can't come to see him because I'm the one and only I can see him. The rest of you cannot. I said, hmm. So I um, got a hold of Don, my husband. I said, you, you know, we need to do something here. So um, to make a long story short, uh, George got home and uh, we were able to get a hold of him only because this Elaine had given him his her cell phone number to make sure that he was not able to contact any of us and he didn't know how to use a cell phone. The guy is 90. He had no idea of how to use a cell phone. So the only thing he'd use is a house phone. When we got a hold of George, we realized that something was definitely not right. He was saying to us that he had this daughter. I said, the daughter? Yes, his daughter called Elaine. I said, you mean the Elaine that you we're going to buy a house for and what happened? Yeah, oh yeah. So to make a long story short, it ended. We found out that Elaine had taken almost a million dollars from him in terms of cash, not only for herself, but her motley crew of misfit family. And she had basically had him in the hospital. She had become as he had said, the surrogate daughter to him. And basically she had dwindled his finances down to where it was unlikely that he would have enough to survive on. But what was really bad and most, and the worst part of it is, exactly a month before George passed away, he phoned up Don, my husband, and asked him to in a very frantic tone to be enduring power of attorney because he said he just couldn't handle it anymore. It was at that that we got in touch with the banker. We got access to all of the books, the funds and so on. And I spent numerous hours, it's documented in this book, to see how this woman took advantage of George. Here's how it started. At Elaine's funeral, Aunt Elaine's funeral, this woman was the piano person, a uh, brand to the church that George used to go to. And uh, so she was playing the piano and Elaine used to play the piano. 
she befriended George, and George was well known by about both he and Elaine were the Samaritan type that would give large sums of money. We didn't know it at the time, but large sums of church congregation. So, for example, if they found somebody in need, they would help them out. Some of the things that they would do uh, would be uh, uh, they actually gave it away to a couple who were in dire states, just gave the farm to them. They, um, the, all the furniture from a place that they'd had before they moved into the condo that they bought, they gave that furniture away. We had no idea. But it was well known within the church group. So George um, uh, said to this Elaine, that would you like my piano? Because I have no use to it for it. Under the condition, George, she would take George out to her acreage. Well, it turns out that it started with small amounts of money of where George would um, felt sorry for when you check for $300. And uh, then the amounts became larger. And this was literally within a month and a half from Auntie Lane dying. So the checks became from $300, they went to $50,000. And then they became $100,000. And then it was, I guess, obvious to her that, um, you know, there would be a track record of this check. So then the deposits would be that she would take him to the bank, not the bank he'd normally uh, be at, but another bank, and have him withdraw funds twice a month of $10,000 each, of which the money won and lost. The transaction of the house was a terrible event. The bank, um, the normal real estate a transaction wouldn't go on, but basically uh, one of George's friends, I guess, was an old geezer and he wanted to get rid of his house. So George had said that he would do a favor by buying his house for this Elaine. So really the transaction went through, didn't involve a real estate agent at all. It just involved George giving the sum of money of 400 dollars to this guy uh and elaine got sole title of the house her name was on the house but the house really was for four hundred thirty thousand. the other uh fifty thousand or whatever it was were missing no monies could be seen anywhere to account for other than withdrawals from george's account so when we got a call from george and george phoned on to be enduring power of attorney the desperation in his voice was worse than I've ever. He desperately asked Don to come and help him out. In the meantime, while he had been in the hospital, uh, the nurses there had told him that he should get some home care. So he did. And he got a couple ladies to come in to take care of him. Now, when I had actually contacted George uh, through this Elaine too, I asked her who taking care of George. She said, well, he's got some people taking care of him, but I don't agree. It's way too They're going to eat up all of it six months. And I don't know how much longer he's got to live, but it's probably not much longer. So, uh, you know, he shouldn't have them. Now, when we were, got very concerned about this and we actually decided to go and meet George to get the enduring power of attorney signed, uh, when we got there, now, uh, George had said, um, uh, Elaine, Miss Elaine, too, would let us in. And I said, great, then we meet her. Well, she phoned George and saying that she couldn't come in. When we got into the place, the caregiver that was with George uh, was very concerned. He pulled us up uh, uh, to, to the side. I said, no, but I'm beginning to get very concerned about this. And she told us that uh, this woman would take George out, take him to the bank, withdraw money, take him home. And basically there was no food or nothing in the house, no food, no nothing. He was not able to take care of himself. He had an old walker that was tied together with shoestrings from his, his wife. Uh, well, she, he had gotten, uh, bought her a customized bed. So the full house he had with, she would take him out to buy furniture for the house. So the sad part of it is, is that 
lock this woman out. We put a restraining order. And now, really, of course, George was really on his deathbed. He ended up back in the hospital um, shortly thereafter. Again, she had convinced him not to get a vaccination for COVID. Not that it probably would have made a big difference, but in the hospital, he ended up getting COVID. And of course, the physician on call there, uh, uh, Don said, well, 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 we'll come and visit him and see what we can do here. Uh, and uh, the physician said, well, you can't because the only one that's allowed to see him is this Elaine one. <laughs> and Don said, well, how is that possible? She had signed herself over as his surrogate daughter. And that basically she had thought that she was legally, uh, had a legal right to be there. And of course, our big concern, he, did he legally adopt her or what? And this is a 60 some year old woman. So to make a long story short, um, in the last days, she really wanted to get in to see George, but we of course were able to keep her out of there. The caregivers, even had COVID. The caregivers donned out their outfits and they were with George in the end. He paid for them, but they were with him in the end. And, you know, um, one hour before George had died, uh, I said, George, you know, I just want to tell you this. I'm going to make this right. He says, you know, I made mistakes and, and he died. He said, you know, I, I don't know what to say. He said, I know what happened uh, shouldn't have happened. He feels bad that he betrayed his wife. Um, he feels embarrassed. Uh, he feels hurt. Can you imagine the emotions of this lonely old man that befriended this lady who basically scammed him? And she left him virtually to die without any food or anything. And um, I said to George, I want to tell you something. It's okay. I promise you this, that I will make this right. So I wrote this book, The Art of the Grip, because if one person is aware of how vulnerable people are, particularly our elderly people, and their families are aware of what can happen, and they are saved, then George's end of his life is not in vain. So hours before George died, I promised him that I would make a difference. And so that's why I'm speaking with you folks today. That's why I wrote the book, because I wanted you to know that even though George Elaine had no children, it really doesn't matter because uh, many studies are now showing that during COVID, there are so many lonely people that cannot see their love. They have families, but the families are far away. They fall vulnerable to these grifters, to these scam artists who actually have no conscience. In other words, they don't care. The sad part of this is there is no restitution for any of this because in many cases, the money gifted to them by these low and you can't do anything about a gift. So basically, they're scammed and there's nothing you can do about it. And so anyway, the, the end stage of George's was that, uh, and we don't know how this will play out, because once the person dies, no longer have enduring power of attorney. And so the bank, they had, Elaine and George, the bank is the power of attorney. So we really have no access to what went on. But it really doesn't matter because um, basically, you know, there's nothing you can do about it other than maybe people about the importance of being there. And if you feel something is not right, and we knew something wasn't right, and the regret that I have actually is that we should have followed up on it, uh, especially if he said he was going to buy a house for this woman. Um, and we didn't. And so I'm trying to even make it right for myself and that I want to make a difference so that no one else 
ever get scammed into something like this and all the things that they've done throughout their whole life um, have been in free. And, uh, you know, it's just a sad state of affairs. So that's really why we have the book here. But, you know, the United States have done many stories and documentary uh, documentaries about how our seniors are very, very vulnerable. And even though they have children, the children are far away and can't see what is going on on a regular basis. So that's why we have the book. And my idea of producing this book was so that maybe um, in, in cases of funeral homes, in cases of senior citizens complex, different places like that can see it and at least be aware that if you feel something isn't right, you need to actually investigate. Anyway, that's kind of my story. And uh, that's why I am to be able to talk to you today to just make people aware about these things actually do go it's not it's and they happen all all the time and if you talk to someone they will tell you about how this has actually happened